Amen. All right, so this morning we covered commandment number one, not to have any other gods before God. Um, next week we're going to go into commandment two. But what I want to do this evening, we're actually going to going to combine uh, two, uh, two more commandments in this teaching. We're going to do commandment 6 and commandment 8. And that's thou shalt not kill and thou shalt not steal. So um, I want to cover both of these tonight. And excuse me, they're very um, short, very simple in the Ten Commandments. Uh, obviously in verse 13 it says thou shalt not kill and in verse 15 thou shalt not steal. So that's uh, the entirety of those commandments found within the Ten Commandments. Now, we're going to start with thou shalt not kill and kill, the word kill in the Bible, and this is where there's a lot of confusion, a lot of people kind of don't understand this, especially the atheists and people that want to say, oh, the Bible contradicts itself. And you see, I've seen this time and time again. Well, the Bible says thou shalt not kill, but then God commands to kill all these innocent women and children and all this other stuff when, it, when they're driving out the Canaanites. You know, God um, commanded that they should sl basically slaughter to kill everybody in the land. The lands, uh, the people of the land of Canaan whom they were driving out were exceeding, exceedingly wicked. They had done all of those things that God made the commandments uh, that they shouldn't be doing, even the really bizarre, weird stuff. They were into all that. And God's judgment was coming upon that nation at the same time that God was bringing his people into that land. And um, this is nothing new. God bringing judgment against a nation. And God's commandment was for them to basically destroy all of them and not leave any of them because they're so wicked. They don't want, he didn't want them turning their hearts away from God, which is exactly what ended up happening because they didn't destroy them all. And God's proven right again. But people will look and say, oh, well, it says not to kill. So, therefore, you know, that's a, that's a contradiction in the Bible. Well, no, it's not. And here's why. Because the word kill, when you just look through the King James Bible and look at the, at the situations that word is used in, it's used both for lawful killings and unlawful killings, if that makes sense. So, um, it's... The people have a problem with the ambiguity of the word, but it's really not that difficult to understand. It simply means, you know, ending life or causing the death of. That's what the word kill means, okay? I, don't, I shouldn't even have to define that for you. It's very simple. There's no hidden meaning. There's no special meanings. There's no special meaning in the Hebrew word. It means to kill, the way that you'd understand kill. Now, and, and that word kill has nothing inherently to do with a motive or a circumstance or anything like that. It's just taking someone else's life. Now, in order to understand the commandment, however, as with all scripture, we need to understand it in context. In context, the direct context with, with the, you know, the immediate vicinity, as well as just the context of the entire Bible. Okay, People that like to just look at one verse and just say, oh, yes, it is a contradiction. You have to take the thing as a whole. There's a little bit of common sense and comprehension involved when you read, when you read anything for that matter, especially the Bible. You can't just take it and say, oh, well, see, it says thou shalt not kill. Automatically then anyone who ever takes anyone else's life for any reason, it's just a contradiction. And God said to kill people, whatever. No, you can look at the usages of the word. It's used in in different aspects, but it's or different um, meanings, essentially. But, you know, one meaning, the same meaning, but one, one is, is used in a sense where it's like, you know, someone who's carrying out the uh, capital punishment, you know, so one person's guilty of murder, and because they've, they've, they've murdered someone else, they need to be put to death. Well, the person who carries out that sentence, they kill that person. But they're not breaking the law. They're not, they're, not, they're not committing a murder. They're not, you know, intentionally doing something or, or lying in wait. And we'll see all these different terms when we go through the Bible of kill or the Bible with the word kill in it and, um, and how the commandment's given. And I mentioned this already this morning that we don't just stop with the Ten Commandments that were written in stone. We continue to look at all of the commandments to get a very clear understanding as to what God is defining for us within these commandments and expanding on that. So, 
Um, God obviously is the lawgiver and he's the judge. He's the one that says this is the law and he's the one that's going to judge the law. The Ten Commandments are not the entirety of the law, as I mentioned already this morning. They're the basics. And that's why as you continue to read the law, there are different punishments for different crimes. Now, look at Exodus chapter 21. Exodus 21, verse number 12 says, He that smiteth a man, smiteth just means that you hit him, right? He that smites a man so that he, he die shall be surely put to death. And if a man lie not in wait, but God deliver him into his hand, then I will appoint thee a place whither he shall flee. But if a man come presumptuously upon his neighbor to slay him with guile, thou shalt take him from mine altar that he may die. So here we're starting to see a differentiation in how somebody is killed. Okay, God's starting to expand and elaborate on the very basic commandment of thou shalt not kill. Now, again, I don't care who you are. When you talk to somebody, just a random person on the street, I don't care if they've never read the Bible before, but if you were to say, hey, there's a commandment that says thou shalt not kill, what do you think that means? It just any person is going to tell you essentially not to take someone else's life, you know, by by murdering them, by just, well, I want this person dead, so I'm going to kill him, right? I mean, that's, that's a very, very basic concept to grasp. It's not very difficult. Anybody on a, on a cursory reading of this can understand that concept. Yet people that mock God's word always want to want to make an issue and make a, a mountain out of a molehill, which really is, there's, there's no contradiction here. There's no flaw. There's nothing wrong with this word. Actually, even if you were to say murder in this context, people can still find a way to to have a problem or have issue with oh well murder what does murder mean then murder is anything that's against the law right well what if it's like it is today in this in this country well it's legal to have abortion so that's not murder and that's how they'll spin it that way then and instead of saying oh yeah well thou shalt not murder that's not murder because whatever you know the baby because it's not against the law but we have to understand when the bible's talking about killing what is it what does it mean but we, so we see right here in Exodus 21, the very next chapter, is that if you hit someone, like you're in a fight with someone, you kill them because you're, just, you're hitting them and they die, he's saying you should be put to death. But he says, if a man lie not in wait, so it's like you're not jumping this guy, you're not, you don't have it out for this person to kill him. Right? You don't, you're not, you're not, it's not like premeditated murder. Right? You're not just, just waiting out and say, I'm going to kill this guy, and that's your intent from the beginning. It says, but God deliver him into his hand. Then I will appoint thee a place whither he shall flee. And we would call that in our legal terms, manslaughter, right? You kill someone, but it really wasn't what your intent was. For whatever reason, it could be because you're working and there's a work accident. It could be because you get an altercation or a fight. And it's like, you know, you weren't trying to kill this guy, but it happened, right? That's manslaughter. You could be driving your vehicle and there's an accident and you and you you kill someone in another vehicle you weren't going out looking to ram them down and 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 end their life but it's something that happened so he says well there's a place where that person can flee it's called the manslayer the manslayer can go into um another city and this is what they would do and it makes a lot of sense because when when someone loses a loved one when someone's killed there's a lot of emotion. There's a lot of people who want to get revenge on that person for killing. I mean, think about, you know, if, you're, if your family member or someone you love was killed by someone else, even if it was accidentally, you'd probably be pretty angry at that person because they caused the death of your family member, right? I mean, if someone was just, if, and even if it's, a, if it's a total accident, you could still be angry at that person. And you don't want to have to... You know, it's, it's a lot better if you don't see that person all the time. Now, in, especially in these days, in these communities, we're a lot smaller. You know, we, can, we live in oftentimes these, these huge mega cities where like you could see somebody once and never see them again and you're still living in the same town because there's so many people and they live farther away or whatever. But um, these, these towns weren't as populous and it's a lot easier to be running into these people. It's not like transportation was quite like it is today. But um, God's solution for that is saying, okay, well, if, if there's manslaughter happens, which it will, 
the person who did the accidental killing, they need to go to another city. And they need to stay there until the high priest dies, and then they could come back. And then he also said that, well, if the person, it's called the revenger of blood. If the revenger of blood finds them like outside of their, of their sanctuary city, of that place where they can go and be safe, if they just decide to leave and you know, go off and do other things or come back home or whatever, then they, the avenger of blood can kill them and it's not going to, it's not going to come back on them. They're not going to be held responsible because they should have stayed where they were supposed to stay. So there are judgments, there are punishments that happen as a result of this, even if you didn't mean it, you know, you have to, you have to, um, these rules have to be followed. But then it says in verse 14, but if a man come presumptuously upon his neighbor, he's already planned this, to slay him with guile. He's tricking him. He's, he's going to kill his neighbor. Thou shalt take him from mine altar that he may die. And so that person you have to put to death. Jump down to verse number 18. We get a few more examples. The Bible says, and if men strive together and one smite another with a stone or with his fist, and he die not but keepeth his bed, if he rise again and walk abroad upon his staff, then shall he that smote him be quit. Only he shall pay for the loss of his time and shall cause him to be thoroughly healed. So basically you're paying the damages. If you get in a fight and um, you, know, you hit someone with, with a rock or with your fist and the guy, yeah, he needs to be hospitalized or something, but then he recovers, he gets out of it, you're liable for the amount of time that he missed, all his work and everything else. You have to pay for him to be healed and to recover. But, um, but that's your punishment. You, you know, if you didn't kill him, if you didn't take his life, um, that's the extent of the punishment. But then it says in verse 20, And if a man smite his servant or his maid with a rod, and he die under his hand, he shall be surely punished. Notwithstanding, if he continue a day or two, he shall not be punished, for he is his money. If men strive and hurt a woman with child, so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow, he shall be surely punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. And if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life. And this is an important verse to, to understand as well, because that's what that's saying is two guys get in a fight and there's and there's a pregnant woman there, right? Like my wife is pregnant. If 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 I were to get in a fight with another man, and we're fighting, we're tussling around, and and you know. That guy knocks into to my wife and, you know, bumps into her, into her womb or something and that baby dies. If, that do, if, if something like that were to happen, but it wasn't intentional, it's not like the guy was, you know, doing that on purpose and trying, trying to kill our child, then there's a punishment for that. He's like, they need to pay a fine. The judges are going to tell him, well, this is what you owe. And the husband's going to say, you know, what, what he demands. And that needs to be to be settled. But he says, if it's on purpose, if someone purposefully were to were to cause the death of my child that's inside of my wife's womb, he says, Thou shalt give life for life. So the Bible very clearly deter defines that a child is being is, is alive inside of the womb. And notice it doesn't say, well, only if the child has been in the womb for three months. Or only if the child has been in the womb for six months. It doesn't give you this determined, well, that's when it becomes a child. As, you know, modern day science will try to tell you, or all these people who argue for murder will try to tell you, well, no, it's only, it's only bad if it's in the third trimester. But if it's in the first or second trimester, then, then murdering is fine. No, the Bible says that you give life for life. And under a righteous law and a righteous government, these abortion doctors... These murderers who have blood on their hands, innocent blood on their hands, if they were to go in and murder that child, their life should be given. That's premeditated and they should be put to death. That would be a righteous judgment according to God's law. But of course, we don't have, we're, we're losing our righteous laws in this country very quickly. And that's not the law of our land, unfortunately. And people still have this idea that a child is not a child depending on how many days it's been inside of the womb. But the Bible is very clear. I don't see how you can argue against that. Turn, if you would, to Numbers chapter 35. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Numbers 35. We're going to read quite a bit of scripture here. It gives a lot more, um, a lot of details about um, 
about killing and the, and the punishments associated with killing. Because uh, we're, we're reviewing the, the concept of thou shalt not kill, but we notice that, is that a commandment? Yes, that's the, that's the brief synopsis, is a brief summary, thou shalt not kill. But we start to get a lot more details as we dig further into the Law of Moses. And we're going to start to see, oh, okay, well, in this situation, they're just a manslayer. It's not intentional. They're going to go to this city. But in this situation, it's, um, you know, it's a, it's, there's a lot more, uh, there's, there's more punishment. It's actually involved uh, taking the life of the person who commit the murder. But look at Numbers 35, verse number 11. And here's the other thing. I just want to point this out, too. The reason why the King James Bible does not say murder in that, in that verse is simply because when it's translated, the, the words it was translated from wasn't murder, it was kill. And, you know, I don't, it, I don't dig back that far into the Hebrew and stuff, but in this case, I did. I looked at it, and that is what the word is translated over and over again. It's the same Hebrew word is, is kill. They, there's another word for murder, because murder is also used in the Bible. But this word was kill, and it was translated appropriately. And what's funny is that the modern versions will say, will change it to murder, because they think that's making it more clear and everything else. But that's not what the original Hebrew said. And what's funny is they don't change any of the other spots to murder. They leave it as kill. But in this instance, they'll change it to murder. And the problem with doing that type of a translation is they're, they're, they're inferring their own, you know, they're making their own judgment on what it actually means instead of just translating it for what it says. Obviously, there needs to be a little bit of discernment on what things mean when you do a translation. But um, they're using the word that's, that is not the correct word that was, um, that was found in the, in the original Hebrew documents. But... Um, Look at Numbers 35. We're going to start reading in verse number 11 because we're going to, this, is, this is quite a lengthy chapter, but we're going to read through this and see some of the some more details on the punishments for, for murder and what, in, what murder actually entails or what thou shalt not kill entails. Uh, verse number 11, Then ye shall appoint you cities to be cities for, of refuge for you, that the slayer may flee thither. We covered this a little bit earlier. Which killeth any person at unawares. It means he didn't intend to do it. And they shall be unto you cities for refuge from the avenger that the manslayer die not until he stand before the congregation in judgment. So there's, there's a trial. There's, uh, um, you know, he's saying, okay, he's going to flee there, but he's going to need to have his day in court. He's going to need to stand trial to determine if he really did have ill intentions, if he was trying to murder the person, if it was an accident. This is the way that, that things are supposed to be treated. Verse number 13. And of these cities which ye shall give, six cities shall ye have for refuge. Ye shall give three cities on this side, Jordan, and three cities shall ye give in the land of Canaan, which shall be cities of refuge. These six cities shall be a refuge both for the children of Israel and for the stranger and for the sojourner among them, that everyone that killeth any person unawares may flee thither. And if he smite him with an instrument of iron so that he die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. And if he smite him with throwing a stone, wherewith he may die, and he die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. Or if he smite him with a hand weapon of wood, wherewith he may die, and he die, he is a murderer, and the murderer shall surely be put to death. So he's saying if he starts using weapons, you, start, you get a pipe, you get things like that, and you, and you kill someone, he's saying that's a murderer. It's different than like getting in a fist fight with somebody. When you start pick, you know, adding weapons up and start killing people, you know, and you kill someone, you're saying automatically you're a murderer. Now, um, I don't believe this is referring to defending yourself from someone trying to murder you. But um, if you're just like, like that guy that was out soul winning today, right? I mean, if this guy just wants to start a fight with me and I just, you know, like... Say, okay, and I pick up a pipe and just like bash him over the head. Well, I'm going to be a murderer then. Right? And this guy didn't, I mean, nothing really happened today. He was kind of just being a jerk. But, um, you know, it, it, it never came to anything. But if, if there was just going to be like a fight and I were to, to, to just start, you know, doing that, then I would be a murderer if I were to, to bring a weapon um, and kill a guy. And he says, the murderer shall be surely put to death. Look at verse number 19. 
The revenger of blood himself shall slay the murderer when he meeteth him, he shall slay him. But if he thrust him of hatred or hurl at him by laying of weight that he die, or in enmity smite him with his hand that he die, he that smote him shall surely be put to death, for he is a murderer. The revenger of blood shall slay the murderer when he meeteth him. Now we're starting to see motive behind this, an intent. Is it your intent to kill this person? Are you lying in wait? Is it, you know, um, is it, you know, done out of hatred? You thrust him of hatred or hurl him by lying in wait, hiding and, and, and just waiting to trap him and, and kill him? That's a murderer. There's no doubt about that. That's not a manslayer. He's saying that person needs to be put to death. And what's interesting about this, and we'll see this again a little bit later, is the way that God carries out his, his justice. He says the revenger of blood is the one that carries out that sentence. So there is, with God's sense of justice, it's, it's great because there is a, a, a certain sense of closure that, that the people who are most immediately impacted by this event get to experience um, some relief especially in being you know if you're the revenger of blood you get to you get to carry out that sentence and I believe that helps in the healing process like you see so many people these days and it, and Maybe not necessarily for murder, although murder would be the same way, but a good way to understand this is think about the people that you know or you've at least heard of that have been abused as a child in a, in a completely wicked, reprobate way. They've been abused, right? And what often happens is it's done by someone who's a relative or a close friend, and that person never gets brought to justice. They see... Their family members continue, continue to act just fine towards that person like nothing ever happened. And even when this stuff comes to light, sometimes people just don't want to accept that that happened. So then the victim is growing up and it really, really messes with their mind into thinking that maybe I did something wrong. You know, why is everybody okay with this? And, and it really causes a lot of mental damage in that person who had this, this wicked act done to them, as opposed to if they were to say, this is horrific, this is disgusting, this person needs to be put to death, and they see the revenge of blood, like maybe their parent or someone actually putting that person to death, then they'll understand, yeah, what they did was really bad, and they got killed for it, and they could be very secure and sound that they did absolutely nothing wrong. That person died for what they did, and then they'll be able to move on and, and continue to get past and put behind them whatever it was that happened to them, as opposed to everything's just fine, or, or he went to jail for, for two years, and now he's just, just living across the street or down the street and doing this to other kids. It's, it's, it's horrible um, the way that we have our justice system these days and how um, lenient we've gotten on crimes that deserve a much, much stricter punishment. So let's, uh, let's keep reading here. It says, verse number 24, Then the congregation shall judge between the slayer and the revenger of blood according to these judgments. And the congregation shall deliver the slayer out of the hand of the revenger of blood, and the congregation shall restore him to the city of his refuge, whither he was fled, and he shall abide in it unto the death of the high priest, which was anointed with the holy oil. And that's, that's if they find the person, you know, only guilty of manslaughter. He wasn't trying to, to harm him or kill him, but it's what happened. And it happens before the congregation, before a trial, before a jury, before people to, to be able to give a pass a judgment and say, yeah, he wasn't trying to murder him. And then he goes back into the, his city of refuge and stays there until the high priest dies. Verse 30, 26. But if the slayer shall at any time come without the border of the city of his refuge, whether he was fled and the revenger of blood find him without the borders of the city of his refuge and the revenger of blood kill the slayer, he shall not be guilty of blood because he should have remained in the city of his refuge until the death of the high priest. But after the death of the high priest, the slayer shall return into the land of his possession. So these things shall be a statute of judgment unto you throughout your generations and all your dwellings. So he's saying, look, it's your own fault if you decide to leave your, your safe city, your safe harbor. If you get out of there and that guy finds you and he kills you, 
He's not going to be put to death for revenging the blood because you decided to just leave your place of refuge. That's your safe place. If, but if you get out of that, then all bets are off, so to speak. That you know, The avenger of blood, if he wants to, can kill you and he's not going to get in trouble for it because you should have stayed there. <clears throat> Verse number 30. Whoso killeth any person... Look at this. Now we're starting to see some context here too. Whoso killeth any person the murderer shall be put to death by the mouth of witnesses. So it's not just anyone who takes another person's life, you know, because there's, there's more circumstances. As we saw, if someone does it by accident, they're not going to be put to death if it, was a, if it was a total accident, if it was manslaughter. But the murderer shall be put to death by the mouth of witnesses. But one witness shall not testify against any person to cause him to die. Obviously, the death penalty is something that's very important. And you can't allow just for one person to lie about somebody else as if that would be enough evidence to say, okay, this person's guilty and they need to be put to death because one person said something. You need to have two or more witnesses in order to, to have their witnesses agree together and be able to, to, to corroborate the same story and say, yeah, this is exactly what happened. But um, one person was not allowed to do that. That would put too much power in the word of one person. But, um, and this is important too. Look at verse number 32, or verse 31, excuse me. Verse 31 says, Moreover, ye shall take no satisfaction for the life of a murderer, murderer which is guilty of death, but he shall be surely put to death. What does that mean? Satisfaction means you should, you, you're not allowed to take any other form of payment or penalty or fine or anything like that for the murder. Like, let's say a rich person kills somebody and they're like, well, you know, he's guilty, he murdered him, but I'll give you a few million dollars and then just let me live. The Bible says you're not allowed to do that. It says the, the murderer needs to be put to death. You can't take satisfaction. You can't say, well, now it's okay because I've received this much money because you can't put a dollar amount on a life. You simply can't do it. The, the, if it's innocent blood, you know, the ground cries out for that and the only way that that can be satisfied with justice is by the, other blood, the blood being shed of the murderer. And that's what the Bible says right here. It says you cannot take satisfaction. Verse 32, And you shall take no satisfaction for him that has fled to the city of his refuge, that he should come again to dwell in the land until the death of the priest. So he's saying in the same case with manslaughter, you can't just have somebody, like, like these laws are instituted for a reason and for a very important reason. You can't just circumvent and say, well, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go and live in this other city for a while. So how about I just pay a bunch of money and then I could just stay here. God says, no, you can't do that. that it impacts too many people and too many things, and it's not going to be a good result if that were the case. He said, this isn't about money. It's about justice being served and, and things being prevented. Like in that case, you know, I, it, it, it's going to vex the person if you have to see the person who killed your loved one all the time. It's just, it, that's what's going to happen. Um, now, it's not an utter banishment, which is why he put on there the death of the high priest, but it could be a very long time. I mean, we're talking years and years and years. Who knows how long you'd have to spend somewhere else. But God made his law the way that he made it. He doesn't want it circumvented. Verse 33, So ye shall not pollute the land wherein ye are. For blood, it defileth the land, and the land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed therein, but by the blood of him that shed it. That's what I was trying to, to say just a few minutes ago, but it's a lot more clearly stated in the Bible, of course, that when blood is shed, it needs to be cleansed with the blood of the murderer. That's the only way for justice to be served. Verse 34, Defile not therefore the land which ye shall inhabit, wherein I dwell, for I the Lord dwell among the children of Israel. Um, we, saw, we looked at this earlier this morning. Turn to Deuteronomy 19. But I'm going to read for you this again. We, we read this this morning in Deuteronomy 13. Um, when we're going over not having any other gods before God, and we saw the severe punishment, the death penalty put on that for people who tried to get others to, to not serve the Lord. 
But in verse 8 of Deuteronomy 13, the Bible says, Thou shalt not consent unto him, nor hearken unto him, neither shall thine eye pity him, neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal him, but thou shalt surely kill him. Thine hand shall be first upon him to put him to death, and afterwards the hand of all the people. So the Bible's saying, look, you can't, you can't have a weak stomach about this. When you have to carry out the death sentence, Look, we know it's not pleasant. We know it's not something that you just want to necessarily do. But he says, don't let your eye pity him. Don't look at him and, and start to feel sorry for him and sympathetic for someone who's a murderer or for someone, in this case, who wants to, to lead people away from God and, and damn their souls to hell. Don't, don't be sorry for him. Look, they got themselves into this mess. You don't have to be sorry for him and then say, well, I feel so bad. I don't think we should put him to death because now you are judging God's laws as not being good enough, as something is flawed with God's laws. And who are you to judge God's laws when you start saying, um, you know, when you start to spare from God's, God's laws, when you, start, you know, when you say, well, I'll just conceal, I'll just hide this so no one has to know about it and, and I'll save this person from death. No, there's, there is very good reasons that justice needs to be carried out. And it needs to be carried out the way that God has commanded. It needs to be carried out in a way that it's public, that, that the whole congregation gets involved, that, that the, the people directly impacted are the first ones to, to carry out the sentence and then the whole congregation. This needs to be driven down into our hearts and our minds of how wicked these sins are because it will make a very long-lasting impact in your life if you were actually had to, to be a part of this. And it's going to make you hate these sins even more. Now, things that are necessary can be very hard to do, but this is something that's necessary. And um, you're in Deuteronomy 19. We're going to see a little bit more into um, what needs to go into the... Um, determination process of whether or not someone's worthy of death. So we saw already, and we're going to see this again, that one witness isn't enough. Look at verse number 15 of Deuteronomy 19. The Bible says, One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin, and any sin that he sinneth. At the mouth of two witnesses, or at the mouth of three witnesses, shall the matter be established. If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges, which shall be in those days. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition. And behold, if the witness be a false witness and hath testified falsely against his brother, then shall ye do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother. So shalt thou put the evil away from among you. So what they're saying is one person says, um, one thing and the other person denies it. Right? Say, no, I didn't do that. You know, you did this. No, I didn't do that. And if that case comes up and one person's just, just very, like, if someone were just to come up to me and say, hey, you know, like, like the, the car I bought, let's say, you stole that car. Right? I would say, no, I didn't. And they say, yes, you did. You stole my car. Well, one man's word against the other. You're going to say, okay, well, we need to take this to the judges. You know, someone needs to determine and make a resolution on this. And now, First of all, you need to see if there's another witness against me saying, yeah, you know, two people said, yeah, you knew, you know, he stole that car. The judges need to make diligent inquisition. The Bible says they're going to search the matter out. They need to seek it out. They need to dig to the bottom of this and do whatever they can to try to find the truth. And if they find the truth of the situation and they say, you know what? These guys were lying. He really did buy this. Here's his receipt. Here's all his proof. Here's the evidence that shows that they're lying. He didn't steal his vehicle. Well, whatever the punishment would be for that crime, he says the false witnesses, they deserve that. So if, if someone were to, were to say that I murdered another person and it is completely false, it's untrue, the death penalty is on, is on murder, right? Those false witnesses, those people, all they did was lie. They, they, told, they gave false witness. They would be put to death if it was found out that they were lying. And that's really important, too, because we have in our law today, we have, you know, perjury and lying under oath and stuff. But the penalty for that doesn't always match what you're lying about. And in the Bible, in God's sense of justice, it would. And it says, and those which remain, in verse 20, shall hear and fear and shall henceforth commit no more 
any such evil among you. And thine eye shall not pity, but life shall go for life. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. He's saying, don't pity him. You say, oh, well, all they did was tell a lie. Yeah, that's very serious. What about the person they were lying about? They were trying to murder that person and have him put to death. And that's literally what they're doing because whatever they're lying about is essentially what they're, what they're committing. And that's what they're guilty of. And that's why they have to suffer the same punishment. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. I'll read from you in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 because you don't even have to be the person that physically carries out the killing to be guilty of murder. Um, 1 Thessalonians 2.14 says, For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us, and they please not God and are contrary to all men. Now here we see the Bible saying that the Jews are the ones who killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets. Now, were the Jews physically the ones that killed Jesus? That, na that, that actually nailed him to the cross? No, it was the Romans that did that. Right? It was the Roman soldiers. It was the Romans that, 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 that carried out the sentence that was given unto Jesus. But the Jews who were the ones who delivered him up and demanded that he be put to death. So the Bible is, is attributing blame of who killed Jesus to the Jews. So even if you're not the one that, that physically carries it out, you can still be guilty of that murder, of, of killing someone. Matthew 5.21, we're going to see here that Jesus actually says something that makes this commandment more strict. He didn't come and alleviate the law. Verse number 21 says, Ye have heard that it was said of, by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Rekha, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Now, Jesus did not come and abolish the death penalty. He did not come and abolish the law. The, the sense of judgment and justice hasn't changed. In the New Testament, if anything, it's, it's even more strict. I mean, he's saying, look, you've heard that it was said that you're not supposed to kill, and if you, if you kill, you're, you're worthy of the judgment. But I'm telling you, don't even be angry with your brother without a cause. He's saying, let alone actually going out and killing him. Don't be angry with your brother without a cause. And um, turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 13. And we're going to finish up this portion on, on thou shalt not kill. Romans 13, verse number 8 says... Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And this is ironic that so many people these days they want to say, oh, no, you know, that Old Testament law, that, that law has been done away. We don't need to worry about the law and everything else. We just need to love people. We need to, to love people, you know, treat others the way that you'd want to be treated. The Bible's saying right here, that is fulfilling the law. And if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. Now, the two commandments, that, the two great commandments, when Jesus was asked, well, what are the two great commandments? He said, thou shalt love the Lord with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. And the other is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The reason why those are the two great commandments is because they, in, they essentially encapsulate all of the law together. So the first five commandments, you see commandments regarding God and loving God and, and being respectful unto God and not having any other gods before you and keeping the set, you know, all these different things have to do with God. And then the last five have more to do with your brother, with other men, with other people. You know, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. When you're violating someone else, you know, you're not loving them. When you take someone else's life, that's not love. When you take someone else's property, that's not love. When you're coveting something else that your neighbors have, you're not loving them. So if you were to love your neighbor as yourself, if you were to do these things, you are inherently fulfilling the law. And people have a hard time grasping that or understanding that that is what love is. When you obey the law, you are loving. That's why Jesus Christ said, if you love me, keep my commandments. 
That is love. You're loving Jesus Christ by obeying Him, by doing what He said. Because by doing what He said, you're not, you're not doing all these other things that a person who doesn't love God would do. If that makes sense. I mean, you're not going to use the Lord's name in vain when you love God. You shouldn't, at least. right? You're not showing your love by God at all. You're not loving God when you do something like that. You're not just as much as you're not loving someone else when you steal from them. Um, which, let's get into stealing now. And, man, I hate thieves. It's, it's so, the, the, this stealing from other people really gets under my skin. This is one of those things that, that just drives me nuts. It's so, it's so violent. Anyone who's ever had anything stolen, which is probably everybody, has experienced that at some point someone's stealing their stuff. It can be infuriating. It can be, make you really angry. And it's, and it's a personal violation. When I was, when I was real young, um, our house had gotten broken into. We had gone to the store. My whole family, we got in the car, we packed up, and we were going. And I don't remember the exact case, but like my parents had forgot something. Like they forgot the checkbook. They forgot something like that. So we turned around and came back home. And we were gone for who knows, I don't know. I, I was pretty young when this happened, but I remember it happening. I don't remember the amount of time that passed. But when we came back, there were people that had broken into our house. And when we started opening up the front door, they ran out the back. And it's, it's such a violation. You, you, you feel like you know, your home is your sanctity. It's a place where you could feel safe. It's a, you know, your place where you could whatever. You know, I mean, you're, you're inside your own home. And when someone just, just comes in uninvited and just, and just violates you and just thinks that, you know, stuff that you hold maybe dear or whatever, they just throw things around, I'm just going to take things. It's a very self-centered attitude is what a thief is. A thief is only thinking about themselves. Now, there's many ways that the thief is going to try to justify this sin in their heads. They're going to think maybe, oh, well, they don't need that. They don't need that much stuff. This person has all this stuff. They don't need that much stuff. I'm way worse off than them. I need it so much more than them that I'm just going to come and take it from them. Because they don't need this. They'll be fine without it. And this is one way they justify their violation in their own minds. Or they'll say, um, you know, especially with like a big corporation, right? People go, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have the guts. They wouldn't have the a way of justifying in their head coming into your house and taking something. But if they go into Walmart or if they go into some other corporation, they'll be able to say, oh, they'll never notice this. Oh, they make billions of dollars anyways. What's, you know, what's five dollars to them? What's that going to be? And they justify this stuff and it's wickedness and it's sin. And don't ever let these, these types of justifications for your sin creep in. The Bible says, thou shalt not steal. This one isn't quite as ambiguous as thou shalt not kill. Okay? And I don't think there's, a, there's really a problem with thou shalt not kill at all. But thou shalt not steal means thou shalt not steal. It means you don't take something that doesn't belong to you. It doesn't matter who the owner of is. You're not the owner. You don't take that. Um, you know, some people will say, oh, well, if someone's so stupid, they leave their stuff unprotected, then that's their own fault. I'm just going to take it. You know, if you... The kid ride their bikes and they, they leave it at the front door. They leave it out on the driveway or something. They say, oh, well, it should have been put away. I'm just going to take this. No, you're a thief. And you deserve to be punished for that. And we're going to look at um, some of the different punishments because based on what you steal, there's also God lays out different punishments associated with that theft. Um, where do I have you? You're in Romans. Um, flip over to John. John chapter 10. If you're in Romans, flip over to John. John 10. I'll read from you in Exodus 21 because there's an example. There's, there is a, the, a, a, a stealing that you can do where it actually has the death penalty on it. And that's found in Exodus 21 verse 16. It says, And he that stealeth a man and selleth him, or if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. That's kidnapping someone. If you steal a person... If someone were to, were to kidnap one of my children, my children were playing out in the front yard, someone comes and just takes them, that person deserves to die. That's what the Bible says. So, and I, man, I wish, that was, I wish that our laws in this country can just, just follow what the Bible has prescribed. 
it would be so much better, but um, of course it's not, and, and of course we're just getting more and more wicked, and of course the laws are getting more and more lax and, and uh, uh, relaxed regarding the punishment of these really wicked crimes. But look at John chapter 10, verse number 1. Did you know that you're justified if a thief were to, to break into your house at night? You're justified in killing that person according to the Bible. Not, not even just like Arizona law or you know, United States law or anything like that. You are justified in killing a thief that breaks into your house at night according to, the, to Scripture. And we're going to look at John 10 and we're going to flip back to Exodus 22 to, to um, complete this. John 10 verse 1 says, and this was Jesus speaking, He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Now, I know he's talking about something. I know this is a parable that's talking about him being the Christ and he's the way, the truth, and life. And I know all of that. But what, I'm, what, we're, what we're getting out of it, what we're gleaning out of this, is he's saying, you know, if, if people aren't coming in your front door to your house, they come in some other way. They're climbing in a window. You know, they're climbing down from the roof or whatever. You know, they're coming in some other way. That's a robber. He says, the same as a thief and a robber. Obviously, they don't belong there. That's why they're trying to come in some other way. That's why they're not using their key and opening up the front door and coming in like, like my wife and I do when we come home. Look at, jump down to verse number 10. And we're going to see a little bit more high insight as to what Jesus says about a thief. Verse number 10 says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. So when someone comes in your house, you don't know why they're there. If they're a thief, you know, the Bible says that the thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. You better believe, you have to, you have to believe that a person that's breaking into your house at night is there to hurt you. It's there, it's there to hurt your family. It's there to hurt your children. This is why you're justified in killing someone that breaks in your house at night because what in the world are they doing breaking into your house? You don't know what their intent is. According to the Bible, their intent is steal, kill, and destroy. And you have to realize that that is their intent. You can't try to sit there and talk to them and figure out and say, well, wait, you know, what are you doing in my house? What are you really doing here? They've broken in your house. They're a thief. <clears throat> Look at Exodus chapter 22, verse number 1. Exodus 22. We'll see this um, explicitly written out. That if you kill a thief that breaks in your house at night, if you kill him, you are not worthy of any punishment. Exodus 22, verse 1 says, If a man shall steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. If a thief be found breaking up, so if you find him, if he's, if he's, in, you know, he's, he's in your stuff, he's breaking up, and he be smitten that he die, there shall no blood be shed for him. And then it says, If the sun be risen upon him, there shall be blood shed for him, for he should make full restitution. If he have nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. If the theft be certainly found in his hand alive, whether it be ox or ass or sheep, he shall restore double. So you're saying, when someone breaks into your house at night, there is just too much uncertainty and, you know, like, you can kill them. But if you find someone stealing your stuff and it's the middle of the daytime, now again, I'm not saying that you're always unjustified in killing someone because they can still be attacking you or whatever else. But when you have the visibility, you, you, could, you can see a lot more what's going on. Um, it's not like you're woken up out of sleep and you're, and you're trying to protect your family necessarily. That may be the case. But he's saying, you know, if someone's just stealing your stuff, it's not, it's not just automatic death penalty because the penalty for stealing, we saw in verse number one, was, you know, depending on what they stole, they just, they just have to repay you. And they'll repay you more than what they steal to compensate you for your loss, for your loss of time, your loss of not having that stuff or whatever. But he says, if a man shall steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore five oxen for one ox and four sheep for a sheep. So they're going to pay you back and it's, and it's going to be serious. But like if it's a daytime, you can identify the person. They've stolen this stuff. You can't just kill them because that's not the appropriate punishment anyways for someone who steals.
Does that make sense? So like, you know, but if they break into your house at night, they break in your stuff, you can't see what's going on. It's dark. All that you can assume is that they're there to hurt you. And if that, if, if you end up killing that person, you're, you're justified. Your blood does not need to be shed for, for that person. And then it says in uh, Exodus 22, verse 7, if a man shall deliver unto his neighbor money or stuff to keep and it be stolen out of the man's house, if the thief be found, let him pay double. So there's these different, you know, if it's an ox or a sheep and he kills it or he sells it, you know, he says give five ox for one or four sheep for one. Or, um, in, in the case where, you know, someone's neighbor is, is watching over, you know, if I were to give Brother Sebastian some money or some stuff, hey, watch this for me, keep this for me until, until I get back or whatever. And then someone comes in and steals it from him. He says, well, if you could find the thief, then the thief has to pay double. You know, the money or whatever, you have to give me twice back what they stole. Now, other than stealing property, there are other things that can be stolen. Um, one thing I found really interesting is in Jeremiah 23, uh, Jeremiah 23, 30 says, Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. So he's saying there's false prophets that can, that can literally like steal God's words and not, and what they do is they don't tell God's words unto the people. They prophesy their own lies and their own deceit and they withhold that from the people. Those people are stealing God's words. They're, they're withholding that. And I thought that was kind of an interesting use of stealing, but it is stealing. And then um, another interesting use was with Absalom. Remember Absalom, the son of David. When Absalom, what he did was he, he undermined David's authority by getting all the people to like him and, and to, to win over their hearts so that they would want him to be king instead of his father David. In 2 Samuel 15, I'll just read this for you real quick. Uh, verse number one says, And it came to pass after this that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and fifty men to run before him. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man had, that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right. But there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. Absalom said, Moreover, O oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. And it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. And on this manner did Absalom to all to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. So Absalom's undermining, you know, when people come, they want to come to the king, they have a great matter that they need judgment on. Absalom just, just kind of stops them and prevents them before they even get to the king. And he's saying, oh man, he's like, yeah, you've got a really strong case. And he just really gets buddy-buddy with them and really gets on their side. And he's like, um, You know, treating these people really well and just, just trying to, to butter them up and win them over so that the people all like Absalom. And he starts saying these things like, oh, yeah, well, you know, if, if I were running things, I would make sure that, that you got taken care of and that your cause, like everything was, was done right and that you would be compensated. And um, this is the way he stole the hearts of Israel. He stole over their affection from, from King David because they were obedient to David, but he stole that away to the point to where David had to flee and um, because he stole their hearts. What other ways can we steal other than property? Well, one way you can steal is actually stealing time or you could steal, you could call it money. If you work on the job and you're getting paid to do a certain job and you don't do that, you start using that time to do anything else other than, than what you're getting paid for, you know? If, and, and again, I mean, everyone's workplace is different. So, you know, like mine will allow for some breaks and you could, you know, do whatever you want on your breaks or whatever. But when you're not on break, when you're work, when you're supposed to be working or, or if your, your break time is, is over and you're still just doing other things and doing things that the, you know, maybe another business that you have, or maybe just personal stuff, anything, maybe just playing around on the computer or playing around 
you know, doing something else, hiding so you don't have to do any work. You know, I, I can think of all these different types of jobs where you can be literally you're stealing money from, from your boss by not doing the work that you're supposed to do. And this is probably one of the most common ways to steal because it's, it's um, for one, it's real easy to do. And for two, oftentimes the risk of getting caught is so low and it's easy to justify these things. And one of the ways that people justify this in their mind is to say, well, I don't get paid enough. So because I don't get treated right and because I'm not getting paid enough, well, I'm just going to do whatever and I'll get around to that work when I get around to it. And people have this type of an attitude. No, you're stealing. You agreed to work at that job for whatever wage you're receiving. If you don't like it, you could find another job, but that doesn't make it okay for you just to steal from your boss. That's one of the easiest ways to steal. Now, another way, look at Malachi chapter number 3. We're almost done here. Malachi chapter 3 will be the, one of the, the second to last place I'll have you turn. Malachi chapter number 3, the last book of the Old Testament. Another way for you to steal is actually stealing from God. Robbing God. In uh, Malachi 3.8, the Bible says, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But you say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. He's saying, look, when you don't tithe, when you don't give your offerings, he's saying that's you're robbing God. You're, you're, you're stealing from God. because Why? Because the tithe belongs unto God. The tenth of your increase belongs unto God. That's his money. It's his goods. When you don't give the tithe, you're robbing from God. Now, um, if you're the victim of a crime or of a theft, one thing you have to look forward to is that God will um, stick up for you, especially if you're poor. You know, we have really extremely wicked people in this world that they think like poor people are an easy target and they've got no one to stand up for them. And what they'll do is they'll just steal from the poor. And it's like, how wicked is that? You steal from somebody who already has almost nothing and you're going to take whatever they do have away from them. That is, that is a very sick and twisted mind that's good, that can actually do something like that. Turn, if you would, to, to Proverbs 29. It'll be the last place I have you turn. But in Proverbs 22, the Bible says in verse 22, Rob not the poor because he is poor. Neither oppress the afflicted in the gate, for the Lord will plead their cause and spoil the souls, the soul of those that spoil them. He's saying, you know what? You may think you're getting away with this. You may think, oh yeah, they can't afford a lawyer. They can't, get, they, they can't do anything about this. They're already poor. I'm going to steal from them because they're an easy target. Well, guess who's going to plead their cause? God will. And you don't want God coming back down on you. So um, obviously, you shouldn't steal anyways. But stealing from the poor is even worse because God's going to plead their cause. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 28, let him that stole steal no more. If this is something you've done in the past, he's saying, okay, stop. Don't do it anymore. But rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. So he's saying instead of having this, this selfish attitude of being a thief and a lazy attitude of saying, you know what? I could go to work and work, you know, 50 or 60 hours a week to provide my needs, or I could just go take it from someone else who's doing the hard work, and that's a lot easier, and I could spend my time doing other things that I want to do. He's saying, look, stop doing that, and you need to labor and work with your hands, earn your own way, and then you'll have, you'll have to give to him that needeth. So instead of saying, well, I'm in need, I'm just going to take what I want. He's saying, no, you need to work hard and then you could give to someone else who is in your situation that's, that's in a time of need. And, um, you know, that we all ought to be charitable anyways if people don't have much. But, but if you don't have much, the, the, the absolute wrong thing to do is just go and try to take something from someone else. You're in Proverbs 29. It's the last verse we'll look at tonight. Proverbs 29, verse 24. Proverbs 29, 24 says, Whoso is partner with a thief hateth his own soul. He heareth cursing and derayeth it not. So he's saying, you know, if you're yoked up, if you're a partner with a thief, someone else who's going around and stealing, he's saying you hate your own soul. You may not think that you do, but you do. 
It says, he heareth cursing and bereath it not. Don't be involved like in business. If you have a business partner or something and you can see they're being real corrupt and they're stealing from people and they're doing real shady things and, and beguiling people and doing that, you know, don't work for a person like that. Don't be involved in that. It says you hate your own soul if you're doing that. You can't see this type of stuff and say, well, I'm not stealing, but he is, and you're, you're, you're part of that, of that problem. Don't be a part of that. Don't be a part of a deceptive practices and deception and trying to, to take money from people and trying to steal. The Bible says you hate your own soul. So those are two of the commandments that were covered tonight. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. Obviously, you know, I think they're pretty basic. Hopefully you learned something tonight. There's different punishments based on the severity of the crime, based on the exact type of crime. And we didn't go through all the examples. There's, there's more in the Bible. I just tried to pack both of these commandments into one sermon. Um, there's more in the Bible, obviously, about murder and about killing and, and some of the different punishments. There's also more in the Bible about stealing and the different, the different fines and penalties that people would, would have to face if they steal from someone. But you get the idea that, that you know, the Ten Commandments are very important, yes, but that's not the entirety of the law. We need to dig deeper. We need to understand everything that God's written. Get the whole thing in context and, and don't be so worried about one phrase that says, Thou shalt not kill and say, oh, there's a contradiction in the Bible all of a sudden because, no, read the whole thing. Read all of the law, and then when you start to see all of the law, you'll get, to, you'll get a good idea of what it even means. Well, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for um, this opportunity to um, hear your word preached. God, I pray that you would please just continue to open up our understanding of the Ten Commandments. God, we thank you for giving us the wisdom and instruction that we need to live our lives. Um, and that you've given us these commandments, God, um, help us to learn more about them. And it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.